So hear now the very word of God as it is given to us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from the 14th chapter, uh, verses 25 through 27. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I mean, the Lord illuminate this word to us this morning. Let's ask him for guidance. Dear Lord, these are harsh words. These are not the kinds of words that are normally spoken in churches today. And yet these are the words that you spoke and so we need to understand what you meant. We need to put it in its proper perspective. So I ask your spirit to illuminate every heart tonight or today that you would reveal to us what they mean and how this relates to each and every one of us. Lord, teach us what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a follower and not just one who accompanies. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In the days of Eli, the priest, the spiritual situation in Israel had sunk to an abysmal state. You read this at the end of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They had become apostate. They, I mean, the ark was still there. The tent of meeting was in Shiloh. But apparently, they weren't keeping the feast days. They weren't making sacrifices. They, they really were not worshiping God. And so when war came with the Philistines... The first battle was telling. The, the Lord did not protect his people. They, they lost it immediately to the Philistines. And they began to scratch their head and say, why on earth do you think we lost? Why didn't God protect his people? And then someone had the bright idea. It's because we don't have that good luck charm that we used to take into battle all those years ago. And so we read this in 1 Samuel. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh. That, and here's the operative phrase, it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies, that it might accompany us on the campaign that we have. Well, when they did go get the ark and they brought it into the camp, <laughs> they were so excited they yelled to where the virtually the earth shook. And so they went to battle thinking that they were going to win the day. But, well, this is what we read. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. And they fled every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of the God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Now, the moral of that story and the reason that I'm bringing it out is because God doesn't just want people to accompany him. He's not just looking for those who are going to come along beside or those who kind of want him in their midst for their own purposes. God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. There's a cost to what it means to be the people of God. And they didn't understand it in Eli's day and they did not understand it in Jesus' day. This is a big problem for Jesus is what we're going to look at today. A whole crowd is following him, but they're not following after him. They're just accompanying him. A great example of this is the so-called triumphal entry. I mean, there was a huge crowd that day. Mark puts it this way. And those who went before and those who were followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes into the name of the Lord. They were all around Jesus. They were moving in one fluid unit and then... Before the week was out, when things did not go right, well, all those accompaniers, by the way, that's a new word, I just made it up, accompaniers there, they all fall away. And, and that's not what Jesus was looking for, and that's exactly what we're going to look at this morning. Brothers and sisters, when I look around me and I see evangelical America and the churches that meet for the most part today, I fear that they're full of Accompaniers. I feel that not only are they full of accompaniers, people who just simply want to go along with Jesus, accompany him, but they're being taught that that is all that was required. And 
Jesus, in our text, he says, no, it's not. There are terms to your discipleship. If you're invited to the kingdom, if you're invited to the, to the great banquet, there are terms. And we're going to see what some of those terms are this morning, some next week, and perhaps even the week after that. Now, you may look at this passage and you may think to yourself, well, Luke, uh, those of you who have been here, that Luke has kind of made a sharp turn. Here he's been talking about the Pharisees and false religion and their false sense of, uh, uh, of salvation and their hypocrisy. And now all of a sudden he's talking about the cost of discipleship. But if we were to carefully, and I'm not going to be able to this morning, but if we were to carefully follow Luke's thought, we would realize, no, he is right on track with what he has been revealing. Going all the way back to where I do almost every Sunday now, to that statement that he makes when he says, strive to enter through the narrow door, and then that not everyone is going to find this door, and most people who think they should be on the inside of that door are going to find themselves on the outside of the door when the master shuts it, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And basically what he is talking about there is who will be included and who will be excluded from the kingdom of God. Well, that, that thought, that train, that theme has continued all the way through. You may remember he, he lamented over Jerusalem because they were not accepting him as the Messiah. And then that whole luncheon at the ruler of the Pharisees where he revealed their hypocrisy and revealed their religiosity and, and saying to them, this is not what's going to get you through the narrow door. It's not what is going to get you into the kingdom of God. And we know last week they raised their glasses and said, blessed are we, because we're the ones who are going to be at that great banquet. And that's when Jesus told the parable that we looked at last week, the parable of the great banquet. And I don't have time to go all the way through it, but it was a parable of a man who threw a tremendous and epic banquet, invited everybody, all of the high mucky mucks, all of the important people, all were invited and all of them accepted. And then when it came time for the actual banquet, they all made excuses. And of course, Jesus is talking about the Jews as God's favored people, as the ones that he has selected, and then how they simply refuse the second invitation, which was Jesus. But the master of the house was not going to let all of his food go to waste, so he sent his servants out into the highways and byways, the streets and the lanes and the hedges, and says, bring all those undesirables in. Bring the untouchables. Bring the poor and the cripple and the lame and the blind. And not just from Israel, but go outside into the Samaritans and, and, and to the Gentiles and bring them into my house. And those who, who are cut out, are locked outside, will look inside and see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob eating with all of these people from other places, but yet they will be outside. That's what he says in that last verse we looked at last week. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall touch my banquet. Well, what he's continuing on is to tell us these are the ones who will be included and these are the ones who will be excluded. And he goes right on and continues that same thought today. So he's not switching gears. I know that Luke didn't mean this because he ended or Jesus ended the parable without telling us what happened next. But you know the way my mind works. I have to think about these kinds of things. What happened to all that riffraff? Okay, do you think that the master just invited them all to that great banquet and after the banquet was over, he sent them back to their hovels and their hedges and their highways and there was nothing that was required of them whatsoever. There was no plan after all of those sinners were brought into the banquet of the Lord? I don't think so. And that's really where Luke's attention turns. So I really think that this is just a continuation of that thought. With that said, let's jump into this text. I'll warn you, it's a harsh text. It's a in-your-face text. It is one that is going to drive right at the very heart of what many people think is their salvation and, ask, and make you ask the question, are you included in the kingdom of God or are you excluded? Notice how Luke tells the scene in verse 25. Now, great crowds accompanied him and he turned and he said to them 
Now, this is the first time in the Perean ministry. You remember Jesus started in Galilee and then he turned his face towards Jerusalem. And he has been in Judea and across the Jordan in Perea ever since. Now, five times so far, Luke has talked about great crowds, huge, vast numbers of people. And, but all five of those were up in Galilee. This is the first time, actually, we've seen a great crowd in the southern parts of Jerusalem or of Israel following Jesus. We heard earlier about crowds increasing in size, but this is the first time that we see that there's a vast crowd. So I want you to imagine a very large group of people. Now, Luke makes a point, and I am not going to tell you that this was what he had in mind. I read this, and this is what comes to my mind. It is not something that is not put forth clearly in the rest of Scripture. But he doesn't say that these people were following behind Jesus, that they were following him as a disciple would follow a master. He says they accompanied him. Now, the word for accompanied, it means almost as if this group of people is moving as one fluid mass, one group of people. Now, yes, they're following somebody. There's some uh, a central person involved, and of course, that is Jesus, but it's not like they are behind him. It's not like they are disciples. They are just there. And they are following him. They are uh, 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 going along with him. And that's the reason I want to spend just a few minutes here to talk about the makeup of this crowd. Because they're all accompaniers. And when I look around at the, at the church today, I see these same kinds of people. I see the same kinds of accompaniers. And, and, and people who are there moving with Jesus, and because they're moving with Jesus and using the lingo, they think that they are disciples, and by thinking they're disciples, they think they're going to walk right through that narrow door. And Jesus actually has something quite different to say. Notice what happens. Now, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned. He stopped the forward movement. He turned to them and he turned on them. And he delivered one of the harshest, most scathing commentaries on what it means to be a Christian that we have. Because Jesus was not the type to allow a false sense of salvation to persist. He's not the type that is going to allow a crowd to think that by accompanying him, by going along beside him, by having him in their midst, by speaking the language that they were going to enter through the narrow gate. And so he stops and he turns on them and he tells them what a true disciple really is through the terms of discipleship. So therefore what I want to do is I want to take a look at the crowd and what the makeup of that crowd was. First of all, there would have been disciples, and there would have been very few of them. The great majority of the crowd are not followers. We're going to define what a disciple is in a moment. But we know the 12 are there. We know that one of them is the devil. We know that people would come and go as Jesus went, made his ministry. And some of them really wanted to be disciples and would follow him for a while. But then when times got tough, we read in John that um, they would quickly turn away. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So there were those who were going to stick, like Peter, who says, Lord, we have left everything for you. And he meant it, and he stayed a disciple. And then there are other disciples who came and went. But for the most part, a disciple is interested in following Jesus. Whether they end up doing it or not was a different story. The second group that I think made up this great crowd were the fence sitters. And there are fence sitters in every congregation and every crowd that is involved with uh, hearing about Jesus. And these are people who were basically disciple wannabes. These are like the men who came down to the shore in Galilee when Jesus was going to the other side. And they said, we'll follow you anywhere. And Jesus simply said a little bit about what it meant to be a disciple, what the cost of discipleship was. And they all went home to their warm beds. They, they didn't want any part of that. So the fence sitters are sort of... 
they're trying to figure out, do I, do I want to follow Jesus or don't I? And they perhaps know what the cost is and have not come to the point where they are willing to say, okay, I will make that kind of commitment. But the vast majority of the people who were with Jesus, the accompaniers, they were the curiosity seekers. They were the miracle chasers. These are the ones who were there because of the electricity of being with Jesus when he started working his miracles. They're not there for any other reason than to see this great prophet, to be near him, to be part of the scene that is going on. And finally, of course, there are the skeptics, the Pharisees, and this close to Jerusalem, probably Sadducees and priests, and, and those are the ones who are looking for reasons not to believe. They're not going to enter so much into this dialogue this morning. But nonetheless, the reason I bring that out is because I see exactly that same makeup of so many of these huge crowds that seem to be following Jesus. But of that group, only a very few are actually disciples. And that's what Jesus is going to do. He turns and he says, we're going to talk about what it really means to be a disciple. So look in verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We're going to take this apart. We're going to take this verse apart because this is stunning. This is shocking language. So we're going to take it word by word. It starts out with a word, if. Now, if you've been here very long, you know that I've talked to you on many occasions about if-then statements. I used to, well, I still do, program computers, but I used to do it professionally. I actually even taught uh, for a while uh, computer languages. And so I, I kind of know what the foundations of, the, of those languages are. And what is known as an if-then statement is very primary to making a machine do what you want it to do. It is basically, basically a statement that evaluates a condition. And once it evaluates that condition, whatever the condition is, if it evaluates to true, then whatever statement is behind the then is executed. If it's false, then it falls through to the next instruction. Well, Jesus used if-then statements all the time. Now, the important thing about an if-then statement is there's no gray area. There's no middle ground. There's no wondering what happens in an if-then statement. If the condition is met, then this happens. If it is not met, then that. It's a branch. Only two possibilities. Jesus would say, for instance, back in the upper room discourse, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. So 100% of the time, those who love Jesus will try as best as they can in their fallen flesh, have a great desire to keep the commandments of Christ. The same thing in the opposite is true. If you are not concerned in keeping my commandments, then you don't love me. And so he starts this with an if-then situation. He's going to create... Of, of a stunning uh, uh, of condition. And if that condition is, is met, it's in the negative, if the condition is met, then he says unequivocally, you cannot be my disciple. Now, the problem with that, and we're going to get to it in a moment, is the way Jesus uses the word disciple here, the way Luke uses disciple, it doesn't mean um, the second level of salvation. It doesn't mean that you, okay, you're just a little bit more committed than all the rest of the people who are just saved. That's not what it means. It is synonymous with salvation. And so therefore, to be a disciple is to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to be a disciple. If you're not a disciple, you're not a Christian. It's exactly what is being said here. So let's take a look. He says, if anyone would come after me. Anyone is one of those all-inclusive, exclusive pronouns. It is an indefinite pronoun, and that means that it doesn't speak about anyone in general. Anyone can be an anyone. 
Anyone in the face of the planet who has ever lived is potentially one of the any ones that he is talking about here. So in that sense, it is all inclusive. But then there's the condition. And only the any ones who meet that condition are going to be the group of any ones that are going to be known as disciples and Christians. And so, therefore, it is extremely exclusive in the way that it, it, it implements. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Luke is telling us, Jesus, through the, through the words of Jesus, who will be included in the kingdom of God and who will be excluded from the kingdom of God. That's why this is so important. And, and, and each one of us is, should be asking ourselves the question as we go through it, am I included or am I excluded based on the terms of discipleship that he is putting forward here? If anyone comes to me, here, right here, brothers and sisters, is the source of a, an egregious error that leads so many people astray when they look at this passage. They think that when Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, it would be like him speaking to his disciples who already are his, already have left everything, it would be like speaking to a room of born-again Christians and saying, if you will now come to me for level two, which is discipleship. And they think that they're actually that Jesus is saying that this is not a statement of salvation because the word disciple is used. But once again, Luke uses the word interchangeably. Go into the book of Acts, which Luke wrote, 11th chapter. He says this, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. To be a disciple is to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to be a disciple. And so therefore, when Jesus creates these groups and he says, if you come to me, he's not talking about discipleship as sanctification. He's talking about salvation. In other words, if you come to me and you are saved... If you come to me by repenting of your sins and recognizing that your sins will condemn you. If you come to me knowing that your righteousness will never stand before God. If you come to me recognizing that you need a savior and trusting and believing in me with your whole heart as your savior. If you say that, then this condition applies to you. Because the condition it's what is going to determine whether or not your profession of faith is true, is a real profession. That's why these terms of discipleship are so important. Because they're also terms of Christianity in the way that he says this. So the problem that exists with that first way that I showed you, if Jesus is indeed saying to the crowd, first of all, remember the crowd. That's the reason I wanted you to see the crowd. It's not a crowd of believers, folks. There's hardly any believers in that crowd. So for Jesus to say, hey, if you guys come to me in discipleship after you're already saved would make no sense. He's talking to a bunch of people who are simply accompanying him, not believing in him, not following him as disciples. So he is saying, if you would be saved, then this condition applies to you. This condition you see, here's the problem that exists in, 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 the, in the modern church, is it creates a buffer. It, it creates a carnal zone. It creates the ability for you to be saved, for you to say, oh, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and then still continue to be just as much of a sewer rat as you ever were. Never having any kind of fruit, never seeing a complete change in your heart, never coming to Jesus and leaving the old man, the old woman behind, because you're waiting for the second wave. Okay, I'm saved, I'm good, I have a place in the kingdom uh, banquet, but I'm going to wait before I do anything until I mature a little bit. Jesus is saying, that's, if that's you, then you haven't made the first step because all Christians are disciples. So he says, if anyone would come to me, and then he gives this stunning, and, and I don't know how to put this other than this is just a stunning condition, does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life. That's the condition. That's the term of discipleship that Jesus lists here. So let's make sure we understand what it says. 
Now, right off the bat, you should have questions. Whoa, is that a conflict in Scripture? Is Jesus telling us to, to, to hate people we are obliged to love? Remember the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother, the first commandment with a, an actual promise. Remember what Paul says in, in Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Throughout the, 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 the Old and New Testament, we are told to love our children, to bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, to, to teach them well in the ways of the Lord. And our brothers and our sisters, Jesus told us to even love our enemies and not just our brothers and sisters. So, is this a conflict in what Scripture says? Well, if we use the word hate the way we use it today, yes, it is. It would be a conflict. Because Mr. Webster puts it this way in his dictionary. It means intense hostility or aversion, extreme dislike or disgust. It means a bitterness of soul that is directed toward someone. And for Jesus to say you need bitterness of soul against your parents would be a conflict of Scripture. But that's not what the word means here. Granted, the Greek word that Jesus use, uses can mean that. But not in every context and not in this one. It is a meaning that Dr. Sproul points out has basically two sides to it. First of all, it doesn't mean hate in the sense of that intense hostility. What it means is to love less. That's the meaning of the word as it is used here, to love less. And it carries with it the connotation that because you love this entity, person, less, that you would be willing, if it came to it, to renounce that person for the one you love more. Now let me give you an example of how this is used. Going back into the Old Testament, and that, that really crazy story of Jacob and Leah and Rachel. If you remember, Jacob worked for seven years because he was madly in love with Rachel. And so, you know, he, he made a really dumb mistake. He got drunk on his wedding night, woke up with the wrong woman. Uh, Laban had snuck his other daughter, who wasn't really as, as, as desirable as Rachel was, in on the wedding night, knowing that Jacob wouldn't, uh, wouldn't know the difference. So Jacob had to work for seven more years for Rachel. Now here's what we read in the 29th chapter of Genesis. In the 30th verse it says, So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. Okay? Now, the very next verse, using the same word in the Greek Old Testament that we have here, it says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So in other words, that's, that's exactly what is being said here. It's not that Jacob hated with a, a bitterness of soul Leah. He had a bunch of children from her. It's that he loved her less than Rachel. And that if it ever came to renouncing one or the other, it would be Leah he would renounce because he loved Rachel more. So that's what Jesus is saying here. Unless you love any relationship less than the relationship that you have with me. Going back to the Greek dictionary, this is what it says about it. Those who become disciples of Jesus must be committed exclusively to him. They cannot be bound to anyone or anything else. The term hate demands the separation of the disciple and the warning not to love anyone or anything more. And that's the test of discipleship. That's the term of discipleship that we have to contend with. And so let me give you a principle in, in just a moment. But a better way for us to read this, and Matthew actually rewords this same context or this same concept when he says, whoever loves father or mother, I'm sorry, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, obviously, Jesus chose the family for a reason. He names every possible member of the family. I mean, just to make it real clear that, okay, this is the relationship I'm using as an example. And the reason he did that, and we've lost a degree of this in our culture because the family is not nearly as important or central as it was then. 
but the most important relationship that you had was family. Whether it was a wife, whether it was children, whether it was parents, whether it was extended family, your family meant everything to you in those days. So if there was ever going to be a relationship that you would choose over Jesus, it would be the relationship of a family. And that's the reason that he uses it. Now, the key phrase from that definition that I just read to you from the Greek dictionary was that it demanded separation from anything and anyone who you might love more than Jesus. And we've already seen that stated explicitly in Luke. Do you not think, Jesus speaking, that I have, or do not think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. In other words, any possible relationship within the family unit that you have that is the most re uh, important relationship in your life, unless you love that relationship less and are willing to renounce it, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot be a Christian. Let me give you a principle. The ultimate statement and therefore the term of discipleship is to love Christ more than you love anyone else. And if necessary, be willing to renounce your most important and intimate relationships in order to live for Christ. Let me repeat that. That is what the term of discipleship is here. The ultimate statement, and therefore the term of discipleship, is to love Christ more than you love anyone else, and if necessary, be willing to renounce your most important relationships in order to live for Christ. That's exactly what Jesus just said, and that's what he meant. But he's not through. Because he has given you one of the most important outer relationships that people have, and, and that would be hard enough, but then he drives to the core. He drives to that relationship that we all struggle to give up. We all struggle with the God or the goddess of self. And I can go down a rabbit trail here and we can talk about all the problems in discipleship and Christianity that self has. But basically what it does is it presents a, another um, idea for us. By the way, when Jesus says even to love you even more than your own life, the word that he uses for life is the same word for soul, okay? The very essence, the Greek dictionary says it's the seat and center of the inner human life in its many and varied aspects. So once again, the principle is expanded. The principle of the terms of the, uh, of the discipleship that he is talking about, the ultimate statement, and therefore the term of a discipleship is to love Christ more than you love any other relationship in your life, and indeed more than you love yourself. And if necessary, it would be to renounce whatever relationship is more important to you than Christ, or to renounce yourself for Christ. That's what it means, brothers and sisters, not just to be level two Christian. It's what it means to be level one Christian. That's what he's saying. This is what it means to be a Christian. And the end, the result of the if-then statement, okay, if you're not willing to give these up, if you are not willing to love me more than you love yourself, to renounce yourself in favor of me so that you might live for me, then the result of that if-then statement 100% of the time now you cannot be my disciple. The word that he uses for cannot is a word that means power. You are powerless. It's the same word that we use for dynamite that came from that word. You're powerless. You're, you're incapable. You're unable. You cannot be my disciple, reminding you that disciple is synonymous here with Christianity. It brings that word disciple into focus. We need to make sure we know what it means in its a little bit more expanded sense. I've already told you several times, and, and trust me, I'm going to tell you again. 
The disciple and Christianity are synonymous. But disciple in and of itself is a word that is scattered throughout the Gospels and, and Acts. It is used in 252 different verses in the four Gospels and Acts. 219 of those verses are in the four Gospels. Just an interesting little tidbit, and I don't know why this is. It's just a little bit of Bible trivia. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. You will not find the word disciple anywhere outside of the Gospels and Acts. Why? I don't know. But nonetheless, that's just the fact of it. And so therefore, it, it, let's, let's, let's understand what is meant by disciple. Now, Jesus didn't create the idea of disciples, uh, of preparing disciples. Instead of going out and holding vast lectures of all the people, you know, because what you end up with is a lot of accompaniers on that, he, he, he focused on just his disciples. Now, there were already the idea of discipleship was going on, and the rabbis at that time had disciples. Now, the rabbis, for the most part, were teachers. So, therefore, the disciples are learners, they're pupils, and they're followers. Because many of the rabbis, if not most of them, were itinerant preachers. They would go from town to town to town, teaching in the synagogues, very similar to what Jesus did. And they were developing these men, these disciples that would follow them. But it's important to know what the end product of that discipleship was. The, the rabbis were not creating little rabbis or the next generation of rabbis. That, it, that, that wasn't the focus. It wasn't a traveling seminary. They, they, they really weren't even trying to create the, the holy men. What they wanted to do by their disciples is to establish solid, faithful, and capable leaders to Judaism. Once again, the Greek dictionary, Mr. Kittle says this, used exclusively for the one who gives himself to scripture and the religious tradition of Judaism. Now, you can just look at that and you can see, well, there are very many similarities between the disciples that Jesus created or spent his time with and the disciples of the rabbis, but there are some major differences. First of all, it, to Jesus, in Jesus' disciples, J Jesus' disciples were called. Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me calls you, you cannot come to me. You cannot be my disciple. So in other words, disciples were called. Now we have examples of people who said, I want to be a disciple. They're all disciple wannabes. They, they, they all, once they learn the cost of discipleship, they back away. But when Jesus called his disciples walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and seeing Peter and Andrew and James and John, he says, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He walks up to Levi's tax table and all he had to say was, follow me. So a disciple of Jesus is called to follow after Jesus as a sheep follows its shepherd. That is the central idea of what it means to be a follower of, or a disciple of Jesus, not an accompanier, not someone who is just going along with Jesus, someone who is following him as master and as Lord. The second thing is brought out with that statement. The second thing about Jesus' discipleship is that it's not following a brilliant teacher like Paul of Tarsus, followed behind Gamaliel and learn from him. Now, that, that, he was a brilliant teacher and a great man, but to be a disciple of Jesus means that you are a subject of the king. Because Jesus is not just a brilliant man. He is the Son of God incarnate while he was here. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, you are a disciple of a king. And you are a subject of the kingdom of God. That is huge. That makes everything in a completely different standard. Because we are disciples of God himself as he was manifest and the person of Jesus Christ. Third thing about Jesus' disciples, considerably different than the disciples of the rabbis, is that disciples are trained to be world changers. We are trained not just to find a parking place and wait for Jesus to come back. 
We are trained so that we can be the peacemakers. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. Blessed are those who bring peace between people and God. Bring shalom. Bring that the evangelists and the missionaries. That's what we are. That's what we're called to be. That, of course, is what he said in the Great Commission when he said, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. It's exactly what he said at the resurrection. As the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. It's the same thing that he said on the Mount of Ascension. The last words that he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And when he was on the Mount of Olives just before his crucifixion, he says this gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. When Jesus creates disciples, he doesn't create them to remain in the sewer. He calls them out of darkness into light to be the change agents of a fallen and sick world. That's the plan from the very beginning. We have been called now out of the world, but to remain in the world. Because we are change agents for the kingdom of God. A disciple is a learner, a follower, a subject of the king. Therefore, a disciple and a Christian are synonymous. Every Christian is called to this. This is not a higher level of Christianity. It is the very fundamentals of Christianity. Well, Jesus goes on. He's going to give us another term of discipleship in verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I know this is tough language, folks. I'm, I'm, I'm just reading to you what, what Jesus said. Now, once again, we've already heard that statement. Jesus has already said it. Different situation, talking more about his own suffering, talking uh, in, in very much the same um, uh, guise, but he, he, he's talking positively then. Everything that he says today is in the negative, but he's talking positively back in Luke 9 when he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow after me. So let's take this verse apart like we did the previous one. Whoever, another one of those impersonal pronouns, indefinite pronouns. Anyone can be part of the whoever, but the whoever associated with this condition is going to end up as a very exclusive group. So once again, we start with an all-inclusiveness. We end up with an inclusive uh, a group. I'm sorry, an exclusive group. The whoever's, if you will, who are willing to pick up their cross and to follow after Jesus. Whoever it will not, again, in the negative, whoever does not bear his cross. That word means to carry something of great weight, to carry something very, very heavy. And of course, we know not only in a physical sense is a cross heavy, but it is very heavy as well in a spiritual sense. But I want you to notice something. Now, be very careful about this. Jesus does not say, whoever will not hang on a cross and suffer and die for me. That's not what he says. He says, whoever does not bear his cross. So he's not talking about the actual scene of being nailed to the cross and dying there. He's talking about carrying that cross through town. And that's the image that we're supposed to see. I'll come back to that in a moment. We all know what a cross is. We know that it was an implement of unspeakable torture, a way to execute people. But once again, the image that we have now is not on the cross, but bearing the cross. That's the image that Jesus wants to, to see. Whoever does not bear his cross, that word bear is, is also in the present tense. So it picks up that idea of bearing your cross daily. This is an ongoing situation. Who is not in the process of bearing this cross and come after me? Now it's exactly the same thing, same word for come, the exactly the same idea, but he adds that word after to it. The word after is a marker of position. It means to position yourself 
behind an entity. I want you to notice the difference between this and the accompaniers who are all around, before and after, to the side, to the left. It doesn't matter. I'm just there. I'm on the peripheral or I'm near the middle. I'm just one part of a fluid unit that's moving along. That's not what Jesus says here. He says, whoever is not willing to bear his cross and come after me as a sheep follows a shepherd. In Palestine, the shepherd always leads. The sheep always follow after the shepherd. You are my sheep. You are my disciples. I am your master. That is what he says in the negative. If you aren't willing to do that, you cannot be my disciples. If you're not willing to do that, you cannot be a Christian because disciple and Christians are interchangeable. Um, let me just step back from that and, and, and sort of give you the image. Many of you know this. We've been over it many times. Some of you don't. I, I, I told you that what Jesus is talking about is bearing your cross. And again, some people like to say that, oh, bearing my cross means that I'm suffering. Oh, that's my cross to bear. That's not what Jesus is talking about here when he talks about bearing your cross. If you were in Jerusalem and you were to see a contingent of soldiers pass by and a man in the midst of them bearing his cross, it would not matter who that man was before. Because whatever he was before is gone. It's over. He's a corpse. He's a dead man walking. So it doesn't matter if he was rich or a pauper. It doesn't matter if he was a king or a knave. It doesn't matter if he was a righteous man or the worst criminal in the city. All of who they ever were is all gone. They're dead to self. That identity no longer exists. They're a corpse carrying a cross. That's what Jesus means. You're not willing to lose your identity. If you're not willing to die to self and live for me, if you're not willing to be resurrected to the newness of life, if you're not willing, as Paul says, you're our, if we are in Christ, we are new creations in Christ. If that is not you, then you cannot be my disciple. Man, don't miss this. Jesus is not monkeying around. He's not messing around. He has a whole bunch of people who are following after him, and they're nothing but accompaniers. And he stops the forward motion, and he turns to them, and he says, do you really want to know what the cost is to be my disciple? Do you not want to know what the entrance uh, 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 fee is to get into the kingdom of God? No, no money, no merit, no ability. It is trust and belief and repentance for your sins. And if you are not following after me, you will never, ever enter the kingdom of God. That's the bottom line of what he's saying. And he cares enough about you not to stroke your ego, not to make you feel comfortable. Not to say it's okay, you know, at least you're following after me. I mean, at least you're accompanying me. That's really good. You know, that's a good start. Well, I'm not saying that you don't want to accompany Jesus because he pulls people out of accompanying him all the time. What I'm saying, it's not enough. You're not going to make it through the narrow door that way. Jesus was not interested in accompaniers, folks. He's interested in disciples. And the reason that he is interested in disciples is where he's leading his disciples. Yes, yes, sometimes we go through hard times. Every disciple of Jesus Christ knows that. He, he didn't promise us the health and wealth that so many people out there are promising us. He didn't promise us that everything would be fine. So yes, sometimes he leads us through valleys. Sometimes he leads us through hard things. And to be a disciple is really hard. But he, 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 Jesus refused to allow people to fool themselves. He's at the Pharisee's house, and it's the guy's his host, and he calls him out for his guest list because he's only inviting people who could pay him back. Jesus would never allow error to pass without confronting it. 
And that is exactly what he's doing here. He stops and he turns to them. And he says, unless you meet these terms of discipleship, you cannot be a Christian. I want you to know that now. I want you to realize it now because I don't want you to get to the gate and be turned away and be a teeth gnasher for all of eternity. I'd rather give you a little bit of discomfort now than to see you spend an eternity in hell. That's how Jesus did it. And brothers and sisters, as I said, I, I, I am actually frightened when I look at the state of the evangelical church and the country that we live in, the, 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 the part of it that I can see from an international situation. I see all of those elements that we talked about in the crowd. I see vast crowds. I see churches that are huge and gigantic numbers of people are flocking to those churches and they don't have the first clue about the cost of discipleship. It's easy believism. It's cheap grace. It's a, an easy way. And, and, and the pastors who are there, and I put all the responsibility on the pastors. The pastors who are there make it so easy. You're never going to hear this in an evangelistic outreach as far as most churches are concerned. You're not going to see this because that would drive people away. It's going to be so easy. Come on down. All you have to do is simply say these words. And man, you are in. You are an accompanier. And you're going to accompany Jesus right into heaven. And Jesus stopped that entire entourage and says, that's not the case. Look at yourself. Consider whether or not your religion, your belief, will actually get you through that narrow gate. You see, God had a plan, folks. God has had a plan since the fall in the garden, actually before. But the plan was how to bring humanity out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. And it involves the triune God. It is the Father who elects and calls. It is the Holy Spirit who regenerates the, the heart. He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. It is the Son who is the sacrificial atonement for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is God's plan. And his plan was never to leave you in the darkness and in the sewer, sinning just like you did as if nothing had ever happened to you, thinking that one day I might choose to be a disciple. And dear friend, if that is you, you're not a Christian. And, and I don't know how much more blatant I can be about it. And I know that upsets people. And I know it disturbs them. And I know it means that they sometimes never come back. But I would rather give you one difficult Sunday afternoon than to see you get to the gate accompanying Jesus and to think that that gate is going to be open to you. There are conditions. There are terms. But I want to leave you on a positive note. Because there is a positive note here, folks. This is not negative. I know this is negative. Jesus speaks in the negative. But there's a reason that Jesus does that. And the reason is because he is leading his sheep and his sheep know his voice and his sheep follow him. And where he is leading his sheep is so glorious, so beautiful, so wonderful. It is a place where there is no sin, there's no crying, there is no sickness, there's no evil, there's no death. It is a place where you're in the light of God and in the Lamb 24 sevens if there are even days there. There's no sun or moon because you're in the light of God all the time. Paul said, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor have the heart of man even imagined what God has planned for those who love him. And Jesus doesn't want you to get to the gate of that and have never said a word and said, oh, everything is just fine. Come on and, uh, you know, accompany me right up to the gate and just like poor old ignorant in the Pilgrim's Progress get thrown into the, in, into the darkness where there is weeping of lashing, gnashing of teeth. Jesus doesn't want that and so he is willing to suffer your disappointment, suffer your discomfort because it is so worth it. 
every or any degree of discomfort is worth understanding and accepting the terms of discipleship because, my dear friends, only disciples, only disciples make it through the narrow door. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, I know, I know, I know, I know. Harsh words. But they're your words, they're not mine. And you have such a heart and a love for those people who are just stumbling along beside you. You had compassion on the crowds because they were lost like sheep without a shepherd. And here you are presenting yourself as our shepherd, asking us to follow you, but there's some terms, there's a cost. Easy believism is not one of them. Health, wealth, and prosperity is not one of them. Cost is, is total loyalty, total belief, total giving ourselves heart and soul, the very essence of who we are to you, following you as not only our Savior, but as our Lord. Lord, press upon us, press upon any that you know. You know their hearts. You know if they're just accompaniers or if they're not. So hard for us to see because the language is all the same. I pray if there are those here, those listening, who are just along for the ride, that you will convict them in their hearts that it's disciples who make it through the gate. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.